I like to take you to the gospel. I like to take you to scripture this morning and turn to the gospel of Luke, if you would please. The gospel of Luke chapter 12. Anyway, <coughs> yeah, thank you for being here. I'm just going to worship him and pray over him to preach. Gospel of Luke chapter 12. <coughs> Gospel of Luke chapter 12, and we'll uh, begin reading in verse 35, and uh, I'll read quite a few verses so you kind of hang with me. And uh, this is one uh, long, continuous teaching by our Lord and Savior, and, and so I'm going to do quite a bit of background here because uh, I'd like to preach the whole chapter, but I don't. I try to get everybody out by 4 o'clock. That'll give me two hours to get back. Get back. So I don't know if I can get it all in by then. But uh, boy, it's a great chapter. And I preached on them several times. But <clears throat> there's just so much in here. But uh, Luke chapter 12, the Word of God tells us in verse 35, Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord when He will return from the wedding that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants, whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find them watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them sit down and meet and will come forth and serve them. You ever thought about that verse? The King of glory waiting on my table. Serving me. Putting a plate before me. Filling my cup full. Making sure it never runs out. My plate's never empty. You think about that. That's not just any waiter. That's the Lord of glory, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. And if He shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants. And this know that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also for the Son of Man cometh in an hour and you think not. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even to all? And the Lord said, and notice Peter just kind of chimed in there, and the Lord didn't even answer him. It's, it's like he said, Peter, how about being quiet? I'm preaching here. You can ask a question later. He didn't even break his stride. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But, and if, that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens and to eat and drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him and an hour when he is not aware and will cut him asunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, would be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. How much is the Lord giving you this morning? You ever thought about that? Because he said, whatever I've given... I'm going to require it back. You know, Sodom didn't have a Bible. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Sodom didn't have a Bible like we have. And yet we are doing exactly the same things that Sodom did. Now, if Sodom stood before the judgment of God and received brimstone from heaven and hell fire and had no Bible, what's a country that's doing the same thing that has a Bible? That's right. Deserve it. And how much has God given me in this life? And He woke me up this morning, sister. That's more than I deserved. I didn't do anything to get that. I didn't wake myself up. He said, well, my alarm clock went off and woke me up. No. Uh -uh. I can tell you, if your heart wasn't beating, that alarm clock would still be going. Still be chiming in. It'll still be there. How much has He given you? For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. That's a solemn thought this morning, isn't it? Drop down to verse 54. 
And it said also to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, straightway you say, there cometh a shower, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be a heat, and it cometh to pass. You hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern these times? Yea, and why even of yourselves judge you not what is right? When thou goest with thine adversary to the magistrate, as thou art in the way, give diligence that you mayest be delivered from him, lest he hail thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. I tell you, thou shalt not depart thence till thou hast paid the very last mile. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, I pray you'd help me. Lord, I, I, I need uh, unction, anointing. Lord Father, I pray you just use me, Lord Father. Move my mouth to say what you'd have me to say and nothing else. God, just take control and, and have your will and way, Lord Father. Lord, I pray you just uh, just open our hearts, Lord. Uh, we just need a touch from you. You've been so good to us, Lord Father, and, and to whom much is given, much is required. And God, I pray, Lord Father, you just uh, open our hearts to that great truth uh, that you'd work something supernatural, Lord Father, in my heart, Lord Father, in every heart here, Lord God, in every person here, Lord Father. I pray you'd lift burdens, Lord Father, that you'd work in uh, hearts to convict, to move, Lord, uh, Father, whatever the need is, Lord Father. And I just pray for the next little bit, Lord Father, you just put a hedge around us. Lord Father, preach me, Lord, this morning, Father, and I thank you and we'll thank you and praise you for what you're going to do and what you have done. And we love you and we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. I just read two of our Lord's parables uh, that He gave while He was preaching and teaching uh, to not only the disciples, but verse 1 in chapter 12 tells us that He was preaching into an innumerable multitude of people in so much that they trod one upon another. <coughs> Jesus was in part of His ministry when He was getting big crowds. And when people were flocking to see Him, to hear Him, uh, to hope that maybe He'd do a miracle in their lives. And he takes this opportunity to teach them some great truths. And chapter 12 is full of, of teaching and preaching that Jesus is trying to emphasize to these people. It's interesting uh, here in chapter 12 of the Gospel of Luke that of the 59 verses in this chapter, 35 of those verses are used in different places in the Bible. In other words, 35 of the 59 of them are delivered by the Lord Jesus on other occasions that we find in the Bible. So what the Lord is doing here is what any speaker, uh, writer would do is that he's using repetition. And the Lord Jesus would repeat and use repetition often uh, because he is the master teacher and preacher, the greatest Amen. preacher and teacher that ever lived. And so he uses repetition. He does that to drive home the point, to put emphasis where the emphasis should be. And so uh, uh, much... Of this, 75% of this is repeated elsewhere uh, as he preached. And so when you get tired of hearing me preach the same thing, you'll know that there was one that did the same thing. He preached often the same thing to drive home the point. And so when I study a chapter and when I be, uh, be get up here to preach and, and I, try, I try to outline uh, a lot of times what I'm going to say uh, in chapter 12, uh, Jesus does the same thing. And I love it when you come to a chapter and He's already outlined it. He's already uh, developed it for us. And so it makes that, uh, that much more easy uh, for us. And so uh, the outline for this chapter, the background, you kind of need to know. Before you get to chapter 35, He preaches on some uh, topics that uh, He mentions again many times in His sermons. If you read chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, you'd see that He's talking about hypocrisy. He says there, Beware ye of the leaven of, the, of hypocrisy. The leaven uh, of the Pharisees. In other words, what he's talking about here is he's talking about fake stuff. And what he's talking about is beware of stuff. Make sure something's real. And make sure everything in your life is real. Make sure the church you're going to and the people you're listening to are real and not fake. You know, there's nothing worse than fake, is it? You know, I told you about buying that Rolex. Try that Rolex I was gonna try to buy that time for $25. I told y'all that last Sunday. But it was fake, you know. 
And there's nothing, uh, you know, there's nothing worse than something that's fake. He says, beware of that hypocrisy. That's what that really is. And in verse 6 through 20, he says, beware of covetousness. In other words, well, what's your mind on? In other words, he's, uh, what are you coveting? And what are you wanting this? Uh, what is your mind possessed with of, of riches and things of this world? He said, none of that stuff means anything. And uh, you see that in the parable of the rich fool where, uh, you know, this guy there in verse 16, he's, he's a rich man. He says, I've got so much stuff, I think I'll just pull down the barns that I already have. Get rid of all that stuff and just fill it up again with good stuff because I'm so good and I'm so perfect and I've got so much money. And you remember what he told him right before he died. The Lord came on the scene and said, Thou what? Oh, oh. Pretty strong language there from our Lord and Savior. Thou fool. And then he talks a little bit from verse 21, 22 on through verse 34. He talks about the worry. He talks about worry. He uses this phrase here three times. And he begins in verse 26. He said, If ye then be not able to do what thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? And that phrase, take thought or take ye thought, it's a Greek word. It means anxiety. It means anxiety to the point of distraction. It's worry. And it addresses worry there. Our parables that you and I just read this morning, he moves the topic onto two different things. He talks about watching in one of them. And then in the next parable, after Peter interrupts him, he gives... A parable on working. And so the, what I read to you this morning uh, is actually two stories there. One is a parable of watching and the other is a parable of working. Notice what he says there in Luke 37 again. He says, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when He cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that He shall gird Himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And then notice in verse 43, uh, when we get to the other parable, the parable of working, he says this, Blessed is that servant who his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. So there's watching, and then there's doing. In other words, there's watching, and then there's working. Okay? And so a couple of things here, uh, as I continue this little background of what I want to preach on this morning. The best way, number one is, the best way to get victory uh, over hypocrisy, covetedness, and worry, which he kind of talks about before our parables, is to be watching for the Lord's return. Listen, uh, what he's saying here is when your eyes are on heaven, it's hard to be consumed with the things that are going on down here. He tells us there in verse 34, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In other words, a good cure for uh, all this fake stuff, a good cure for worry, a good uh, a cure uh, uh, for anxiety is to have our hearts where our treasure is. Okay? And so you know exactly where you stand this morning. That's a great rule of thumb. What consumes most of your thought life, most of your time, uh, all that kind of thing, when you think about that, that's exactly where your heart is this morning. And so uh, he deals with that uh, in that one parable, watching. And then, of course, he deals with working. And the best way to stop thinking about yourself and your problems is to start serving the Lord and serving others. So there's two things there. When we get distracted from our mission, uh, there's two things that we can do and should be doing while we wait for the Lord. And that's watching for Him. That means watching with an excitement and anticipation and working for Him. Amen. Well, we don't do much of either. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here in a minute. If we want to be faithful, if we want to be wise, the Lord said in verse 42, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give him their portion of meat in due season? It's that one that's working for the Lord. It's that one that's watching for the Lord. Anticipation of His return. Working so He'll find me faithful when He does come for me. And He is coming for you, right? Mm -hmm. He is coming back. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. 
He'll either come by way of death. Many of us will go that way. Many have already went that way. Uh, but if I don't die, He'll come back for me in the rapture. And I'll meet Him in the air. And we'll talk about that. But anyway, He closes uh, all His teaching here about worry, about hypocrisy, about covetousness. He closes it with these two thoughts about working and about watching. And so we want to talk about that a little bit this morning. But let me just continue. Uh, I won't get on this. I guess I'm, I'm scattered because there's so much I want to say about this chapter. But let me just say something about worry this morning. Now anybody in here this morning ever worry? I don't worry, so I wanted to ask. Because I don't really know how to preach. I don't know what that's all about, worry. Jamie, you worry. You do enough to love those. Let me just hit on this. God, the Lord just kind of impressed on that. I wasn't going to preach on this, but then the Lord impresses on my heart because I have a tendency uh, to worry. Uh, <laughs> Believe it or not, as laid back as I am, anxiety it oftentimes will hit me. I, get it, it, I just get angsty about things. Maybe just riding down the road or maybe when I come in uh, to begin my studies, uh, something will happen and, and my mind will start worrying about something. Okay, I'll start having anxiety about something that's going on uh, in the church. A lot of times is kind of the area a lot of times where I'll, I'll, I'll get anxiety sometimes. In fact, Jesus talks about this thing about anxiety. He uses it again three times in verse 11, verse 22, verse 26. That little phrase I just told you about, to take thought. In other words, that's the saying. It's a, it's a verb in the Greek that means uh, to distract. It means to divide. It means to draw different to, to draw something in different directions. And that's exactly what anxiety and worry does. It? it kind of draws us away uh, from important stuff and gets us off on some tangent. And we begin to get consumed by that worry that we're, worried, that we're thinking about. We can't stop thinking about it. Dr. Rod Mattoon in his commentary on Luke said, when a person worries, their peace of mind and ability to focus on the right things is chopped up. Instead of keeping their eyes on the Lord, they focus on things that they cannot satisfy or change. In fact, the average person crucifies himself between two thieves on a regular basis, the regrets of yesterday and the worries of tomorrow. You ever get caught in between those two thieves? Yesterday, it's regrets. And then all these worries about a tomorrow that we don't even know if we'll be here. And often, what we're worried about never comes to pass. You ever figured that out yet? Here's a good little thing on worry. I hope this will help you. Let me tell you when you're probably in, in worry mode. You may be in worry mode in here this morning. Anxiety mode. Let me tell you, this would be a good tell if you're in that place this morning. One, when, you, when the thing that you're concerned about is the first thing you think about in the morning and the last thing you think about before you go to bed. You're, you're, you're well on your way to being in anxiety and worry. Number two, when you find yourself thinking about it during every spare moment of your day, you may be on your way to being in worry, anxiety. When you find yourself bringing it up in every conversation you have, that's a good indication that you're worrying about something and to the point where it becomes sin in your life. Okay? This is what worry is. It's, it's an unordinate amount of concern over something and that you ought not be concerned about. It's not uh, the worry or the anxiety or the fear if I see my kids uh, playing around the stove and there's a hot bowl of water on there and I'm a little anxiety over there and I go and bring them back. That's the good kind of uh, fear. That's the kind of stuff that Jesus put in your life, discernment that should prevent you from getting hurt. This is not that kind of worry. This is over stuff that you can't do anything about. John R. Rice said this, he said, it's putting question marks where God has put periods. Uh, Charles Mayo is a, is a very famous physician. You may have heard the Mayo Clinic. He was an American physician. He called worry the disease of doubt. He said it affects the circulation, the heart, the glands, the whole nervous system, 
He said, as a, as, a, as, a, as a doctor, I've never known any man who died from overwork, but have known many people who die from worry and anxiety. Think about it. This is, this is Charles Mayo, one of the most famous doctors that ever lived. In other words, worry doesn't, always, doesn't only affect, it affects you physically. In other words, worry, uh, have you ever got so worried that, uh, I mean, your head's hurt and your heart's pounding, your whole uh, face and uh, expression will change. You're so worried and so frustrated. And it's not good. George Mueller said, many times when I could have gone insane from worry, I was at peace because my soul believed the truth of God's promise. If you got a worry problem this morning, it's because you're not watching in anticipation for the Lord to come and you're not working for Him. In other words, He said, listen, if you'll watch for me, uh, you won't have time to be thinking about these little things because when I come back, listen, my reward is with me. Yeah, you got something to think about. And listen, have you, listen, the best way to cure what's on your mind and your pity party and our worry is to go help somebody else. Yeah, right. He said, go up and start serving and doing what you're supposed to be doing, and it'll take your mind off what you're worrying about. And so, <clears throat> one more background, and then I'll start preaching. <laughs> Running out of time about these parables. Both these parables are set with the background of the Lord's return. Both of them. In other words, uh, the meaning and the power behind this message is the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's, that's where the power is of these messages because in both messages, the Lord of the house, the master of the house, the good man of the house has gone away for a little while. And he's expecting those that's left to do what they're supposed to be doing. And what he's talking about is Jesus has gone away. And he's expecting you who carry his name. Now, I'm not talking to you ain't saying I'm talking to you Christians this morning. If you're a Christian, you're carrying his name with you. Now, that's just like Cooper and Bailey. They carry my name, okay? And I take offense if they do something to embarrass my name. Uh, right. I just do it. Well, what about when you do something to embarrass them? Well, I, I don't do something to embarrass them. I don't even want to talk about all the embarrassing things. But what I'm saying is, you carry the name of Christ with you. And... You have a responsibility to uphold that banner wherever you go. And he says, listen, you need to be watching and waiting because Jesus talked more about His second coming than He did about His first coming. In fact, the Bible talks more about His second advent than it does about the first one. It's amazing when you start reading the Bible. Uh, if you look and study the whole Testaments together, it's the most important, the most frequently mentioned doctrine in all the New Testament. Old Testament as well. One out of every 25 verses in the New Testament is a reference to His second coming. Think about that. That's pretty impressive. One scholar has estimated that 1,845 references to Christ's second coming is found in the Old Testament. 260 chapters of the New Testament there are 318 references alone to His second coming. That's amazing amount of material about His second coming. Now you notice another background point that we read in that first parable, the one of the watching, not the one of the working. But verses 35 through verse 40 is the one where we are commanded to watch. You'll notice uh, that the good man of the house, the Lord of the house, has gone to a wedding. Okay? Now stick with me on this because the weddings are important in the Bible. You see them throughout Scripture, but I'll just stick to the New Testament. Jesus did His first miracle at what? A wedding. A wedding. He talks about it all the time when He's preaching. He talks about it uh, in Matthew 25 when He's talking about the ten virgins. He uses a wedding illustration. In Matthew 22, he talks about the marriage of the, uh, the, the marriage, parable of the marriage feast. That's in Matthew 22. He's talking about the marriage here. Revelation 19 talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? And where the church is going to celebrate our wedding 
to the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we'll be doing that up in heaven while all hell on earth is being cut loose down here. Yeah. And you say, well, that's like seven years, a long time to celebrate a marriage. Here's the deal. The marriage was very symbolic in that time of what Jesus wanted to teach. Here's what would happen. They would get married, a young man and a woman. It would be arranged by the Father. Okay, let me go through this a minute. It would be arranged by the Father. And they would get married and would be legally bound to one another uh, uh, in a little ceremony uh, that the father there would conduct, the father of the, the bridegroom, and they'd get together and have just a little private ceremony. But then the son would go away. That's good. Yeah. Yep. And what he would do when he went away is he would leave his bride there, but he would go away and he would begin to build her a mansion. Yeah. Amen. He would begin to build her a place where they could live together forever. Yep. But it wasn't just any old place. The mansion was determined, in other words, the size of the mansion was determined by how rich the father was. Hey. Well, one person is getting these. Hey. And so after uh, he went back, he would begin to build on this mansion. And as much riches as his father could throw at this mansion, the son would build this place. He would prepare a place for his bride. Hey. And when the father would come by and saw that the place was adequate, he would tell his son, he would say, go get your bride. Yep. Yeah, that's right. So it would not be unusual uh, for us to be up in heaven uh, and have a seven-year marriage supper hey. celebrating our wedding to the Lord. Because, see, the marriage supper would last as long as the riches of the Father would last. Hey. So seven years is not that long because hey. uh, He owns it all. Yeah. And listen, He's going to have a supper up there. And while hell is being broke loose down here on earth, the church, those that have been born again, right. are up at the marriage supper of the Lamb and join our, our, our Heavenly Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, girding Himself and serving us. Hey. It's good stuff. So he's going to come back, though, when it's time, and he has everything prepared, he's going to come back and get his bride. But anyway, this, that is the background for the marriage there, and you can kind of see why the Lord's Savior would use that, because everybody knew that was how marriage was. And so he uses that for a background. It's his second coming. So what's he doing up in heaven while he's getting ready? For you and I to come get us. Here's what he's doing. Well, of course, he's getting ready for us. He's building a mansion. But the Bible says he's also interceding for me. The Hebrews 7.25 says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. You know what he's doing for me? He's praying for me. He's done, listen, he's coming to the holiest of all. He sprinkled His own precious blood before the throne. Yep. And He's in there ever living. Ever living for something means that you, you're really into it. Okay? Ever lives to do that. It doesn't mean just occasionally like my prayer life. Or occasionally I make intercession for somebody. Occasionally I pray. And friend, when I look at my prayer life, I, I feel like it is occasionally when I think about our Lord and Savior and His prayer life. Amen. But He's on the throne. He's in before the Father. And He's praying for you. Before you ever pray, before your problems ever come, before you even know what's about to hit you, before the valley comes that you're about to walk through, the mountain you're about to climb, uh, the sickness, the death, the financial heartache, whatever's coming your way, before it ever happens, you had one that's on His knees. Amen. Oh, God, Father. Amen. That was mine. Hey, I need this for him. Hey, I'm praying this for him. Yep. King of Kings is praying for you. That's what he's doing. What are you doing down here while he's up there doing that? That's what he's saying in his parables. What are you doing? Because he is keeping his word. He is doing exactly what he said he'd do. 
Yep. He's making intercession for you. What are you doing down here for him? With what he's giving you? You doing anything with what he's giving you? How many people uh, this Sunday morning, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to start preaching, so I'm going to take my jacket off. How many people has God blessed with a car this morning? Sitting and blessed them with a bed and a good house and they're sleeping. Yep. When they ought to be somewhere at church. Right. Honoring God. Yeah. How many of us is blessed with good enough health to get up yeah. out of bed? Yeah. And what are we doing with that health for Him? Because I tell you, He's pleading for you. He's interceding for you. He's interceding for me. He's making intercession for me. He's preparing that mansion for me in John 14. But I like this part. He is advocating for me Amen. in heaven right now. 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ, the righteous. You know what an advocate is? It's one, it's a, it's, it's a legal term. It's a law. What we call it. It's one who pleads the cause of another. One who pleads the cause of another before a, a judge, before a tribunal council. It's one who defends, vindicates, espouses an argument. He's a pleader. He's an advocate of truth. In other words, he presents the evidence for your trial. Look at it that way. It's a legal term. You've been accused of sin. Yeah. And you're guilty. <laughs> you're guilty. And boy, when you're guilty, boy, you better have a you better be lawyered up. You better have a good law. Yeah. Yep. And so uh, they bring the evidence forth to the judge. And the evidence is, is your sin in your life. You think, boy, I never knew I did that. Man, they bring in uh, exhibit A, exhibit B. Man, they're throwing all kinds of stuff out there. You're guilty, dead to right. Man, he done opened up your thought life. He's looking at that. Hey, he's looking at that. Uh, he's seen how many times you lie. Now, I know none of y'all ever lied, but I, I, believe it or not, I've lied before. <laughs> he's bringing all that up every time you've lied, every time you've lusted, <coughs> all the evidence, exhibit. Yep. Unbelievable how many yep. things is against you. And he turns over to your advocate. He turns over to Jesus, my advocate. Hey. And he says, well, what do you have to say? What kind of evidence do you have to present? <laughs> and he says, well, judge, first of all, let me throw these out here. Hey. He said, these nail scarred hands. Okay. He said, here's one bit of evidence. Hey. Here's a nail scarred hands. He walks in front of the judge and he says, here's another uh, bit of evidence. Uh, my righteous robe dipped in blood yep. with a name written on it that says King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. He said, there's my evidence. In other words, his evidence says I'm innocent. Yep. And the judge sees that evidence that Jesus brings forth. Hey. And he takes his gavel. Innocent. Hey. Hey. Not guilty. Right. He's my advocate. That's what he's doing for me and him. Hey. And he says, What are you doing down here while I'm up in heaven being your advocate? You waiting on the Lord with a great anticipation. The Bible says, Not only are we to wait, uh, but I'll close with it. it says, We are to watch. With great anticipation. He says, we're to be working, busy. We're not to be idle. We're not to be neglectful. We're to be diligent, dependable servants. For unto whomsoever much is given, much is required. And then you notice that last part of Red T. Not only would be waiting, watching, working, we ought to be wise this morning. That's what he says here. That's what he says. When thou goest with thine adversary to the master, as thou art in the way, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him, lest he hail thee to the judge, and 
and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. You know what he's talking about there? He said, you ought to be wise enough to know you need an advocate when you leave this world. You need an advocate before the judge of every living thing. If you go before Him without Jesus, without your advocate, without the evidence of the nail-scarred hands and the blood and the cross, listen, if you go before Him, He will be your judge. Yep. Yep. In the Bible, did you read that last verse? He said, you'll not be released until you pay every little thing you owe. You know how long it's going to take you to pay the penalty for your sin? Forever. Yep. You're not going to get out because you're going to pay eternity for your sins yep. in a place called hell. Everything that you owe for your sins by a just God, you're going to be punished for on your own merits. Yep. But he said, a wise man to get lawyered up. Right. Hey. Amen. You ever heard that speech? Hey, Friend, if you get in trouble, you get a speed ticket, what do you go do? Yeah. You ain't got to say it. You go get lawyered up so your insurance don't come up. Friend, I want to tell you, you better be lawyered up. In other words, you better have the advocate. You better have the blood. You better be on the other side of the blood this morning. Because that's what wisdom is. What fool would say in his heart, I think I'll just take my chances. <laughs> I think I'll just go before this judge. He looks so nice. He looks like my grandfather. I, I know he's going to let me off. I just think I'll go before him and just plead my own cause. That'd be foolish, wouldn't it? That'd be real foolish. But people are drying off in the hell every second of the day doing the same thing. I'll just take my chances with my life and my good works. No, you need an advocate. Hey. His name's Jesus Christ. Hey. I wonder if we just stand. We'll get a song invitation. Near the cross, 515. I've been all over this chapter and back again. I probably haven't made a lot of sense. So many things on there I wanted to say, and I couldn't get my thoughts together much. But I pray the Lord do something with the word that was read in your heart. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you haven't got a chance before the judge. It's, it's not going to cut it. You're guilty. You need someone to plead your cause. You need someone to take your place. You need an advocate. You need the blood this morning. It's just as simple as that. We'll give you a chance to come and make sure you get, make sure. Don't leave here unsure. Make, make sure that you know it, that you called upon his name. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know what, I, I never thought about it like that. He's done so much for me, even today. And you know, I've been all week and I don't even think I've thanked him one time this week for what he's done for me. I just want to come and thank him a little bit. He's done so much for me. And I've been so unthankful that I haven't really done what I've been supposed to have been doing while He's gone doing all that for me. But I'm down here. I'm not watching. I'm not working. I'm not waiting. I'm not being wise. Why don't you come and just say, Lord, I want to thank you for what you've done for me. I want to be more like you. You come. Maybe, maybe you just say, you know what? I'm not sure this morning that I, I really am saved. I just maybe you think you are, but you're not real sure. And you just want to say, you know what? I just want to share that thing up this morning. I want to call upon His name. You call upon His name. The Bible says He's faithful and just. Well, He'll hear you and He'll save your soul. You can be sure of your eternal destination. He'll help you. You can't, you can't clean yourself up. You can try and try to clean yourself up. You can't do it. If you wait for that, you'll never come. You just need to say, you know what, Lord, I said so you can clean me up. Come just as you are. While you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. Maybe you need that experience. If you do, you come. 
I'd love to share Jesus with you. Just a few moments. When we leave here a changed person. Here we come. people have suffered in this life. 